but because um, because uh, I don't have any control over the recordings, uh, what I've started doing is just downloading them from the Microsoft Cloud and uploading them to a YouTube channel. What I'm going to do, it's the, sort of a, a Harper Adams data science channel. Now, the links for the past meetings, for the past few meetings, for the boot camp and um, back as far as the uh, GitHub website meeting, um, I've gone ahead and I've uploaded them. But, but meetings before that, um, I'm, I'm not going to download them and upload them. Uh, probably on that YouTube channel, I will upload some formal lectures to go along with the boot camp and, and maybe some other things too. We'll see how much time and bandwidth I have going forward. The boot camp this week, uh, the link is right here. Let's just have a look before we start. Um, this one is about data frames. One of the commonest questions with um, people who are just starting to, to use R is how do I get my data into R? We're used to seeing our data on a spreadsheet. We're used to seeing a visual spreadsheet-like representation of it. But um, with R and most other computational languages like Python, and um, actually you can you can use um, SPSS and GenStat also purely with the command line, and you don't need that that visual representation of your data frame. Um, but getting your data into R, being able to see it is what people want to do, what we're trained to do from using Excel. And that's a that's a hurdle. That's the first hurdle. Our studio has made it easier, but we'll just sort of talk about that today. But if there aren't any comments, I'm going to go ahead and start with the slides first. Let me bring them up. If you want to follow along, you can do so with the uh, slides link right here. Um, and like previous weeks, I have um, I've also linked to the R Markdown document I used to make these slides. So if you're interested in doing that for yourself, uh, you can do that. You can output them to PDFs or even to PowerPoints, but I've put output these to um, <clears throat> HTML slides. Okay, so this is Bootcamp page 1.4 data frames. Now, um, one of the um, things that that we've talked about before is this concept of of our space and uh, today the metaphor is um, is where the a data frame a data set if you will the the R terminology for a data set that is a, a type of object in memory uh, is a data frame why is it called a data frame? Well, there's no good reason. It's just the jargon that that uh, we use in the R world. And we've talked about vectors and matrices and arrays in the past. And one of the things that differentiates a data frame from vectors and matrices and arrays is that um, vectors, matrices, arrays, and even single um, most single R objects can only be um, one data type. All of the data in a vector, all of the data in a matrix, all the data in an array must be of the same type. So a numeric value that's an integer, a numeric value that's a decimal, a, new, a character data, and so forth, logical data. <clears throat> but a data frame allows us to have different data types and uh, we store them in columns. Uh, if we're using Excel, we might visualize them in columns. Um, and each column is a vector of data, and each vector is you know, like a normal vector in our all the same data type. Each row is a unique observation. And uh, you can access variables like a matrix that are in a data frame in R. So we're going to talk through that and look through some examples. Now, the, the metaphor today is for a data frame, and this is sort of a, a image that is meant to depict a um, a bedroom, maybe that's tidy, it's cleaned up, and it's organized, and the bed is made, and um, there's some some little decorations around. And th this idea of a tidy data set is something that we've mentioned before. You've probably heard me mention it before. We're going to talk about that a little bit today too. Okay, so uh, here's what we're going to go through. 
the tidy data concept as a way to start thinking about archiving your own data. I have mentioned this before, and I don't want to beat it into the ground, but um, the tidy data concept is considered best practice these days for uh, scientists like yourselves and uh, like myself. And it's very convenient. It's the best way to store your data for your future self, for collaborators, to get help from me, to communicate with your supervisor, and to create a document of your data. So we'll talk about that. We'll only be able to scratch the surface on this, of course, and if this is new to you, I strongly encourage you, you to take responsibility to find out and make sure you're confident about what data, tidy data is and aspire to always store your own data in tidy format. So I'll give a few examples of that. I'll also talk about a few other um, common data file types uh, that you probably have encountered. I, after trying different formats over the years, um, I have found for me, when I work with other people and for most other people, the best format at the moment is Excel. As long as you use tidy data format, Excel files are fine. They work perfectly well and are, they're very useful. I'll talk a little bit, make a few remarks about that. Then getting your data into R, once your data are tidy, uh, is very easy. It's very easy. The problem that most people have is that their data starts off not in a tidy format. So it's an important part of the workflow here. We'll, we'll, most of the coding we'll do today is, is about manipulating variables that are in data frames. We've done a little bit of that and talked about data types like factors last time, which we'll tap into just a little bit today. Then there are the exercises, so we'll get on to those. Now, the tidy data concept, as far as I know, is credited to a um, yeah quite famous now data scientist who's, who's quite young. Um, he, um, he's the chief data scientist at R Studio. He comes from a programming background, but has a PhD in statistics. He knows what he's talking about when it comes to data. And he wrote this paper some years ago, simply called Tidy Data. Now, if, if you have ever seen, I've, I've seen him give a few talks, uh, one on tidy data in person, but you can find videos of him speaking uh, online. You can attend the USAR or the R Studio conferences. They've been free for the last couple of years, and you can find recordings of him doing keynote addresses at those meetings for the last couple of years. It's worth, if this is a new idea to you, possibly seeking out one of the um, videos for a longer explanation, or better yet, read this paper. Just have a look at it. Some of the concepts will be like, oh yeah, I already knew that. Some of the concepts might be, okay, I never thought of that. That's interesting. But tidy data is, it's a concept that you can practice with any kind of data system or any kind of programming language or any kind of data storage format. But it's the format to start with. Um, I mean, it's considered best practice these days. It's widely considered best practice, all deriving from this paper. But um, it's also the place you have to start to do any sort of data analysis. Your data have to be in some, some form of tidy data format to analyze them. Not only that, tidy data is very easy to get your data into as long as you understand the concept and, and choose to practice it from the very beginning. You cut out all the all the work that's required later to to attain it. So I'm going to briefly outline it today, but it's worth reading this paper if the idea is new to you. All right. So the um, the idea with tidy data is that your data should be stored for posterity, but also for utility in a format that is uh, that is standard, that is accessible to yourself not just now, but your future self, but also accessible to other people, other people who might be collaborators, other people who might be um, funders or data stakeholders uh, for the data. And, and in fact, if you can't even think of anybody on the list, um, maybe just your future self, documenting your data for your future self should be good enough to always practice tidy data because it's so easy, because it's best practice should be reproducible. Um, that means it should be in a data format that's not going to go extinct or um, not going to be changed 
uh, for commercial purposes in the in the near future. Um, it should not be a in a haphazard format where you embed other stuff, just you're noodling around with your own data, data summaries, things like that. So uh, the tidy data format is very simple. It's um, one column per variable. So you measure a thing like length of a potato, weight of a potato, something like that. You um, have one column for each of those things you measure. Uh, there's one row per observational unit. If you're, if you're measuring one plant or one insect at a time, you have one row per every set of observations. The thing that I often see is uh, what if you go and like you're counting the um, the number of um, eggs laid in a in a experiment and you do it over time? Uh, what I often see is people want to do the egg count in a column for for the first time they measure them. Then they'll have another column of exactly the same thing, the egg count for a second time and maybe a third and a fourth. But but actually tidy data. Uh, dictates that that's um, that's not the best way. The best way would be to have this that one variable, the thing you measure, um, all in the same column, and then to have the date or the time period that you measured it as a variable in a second column. So um, so that's what we mean by one row per observational unit. To repeated measures, you have a variable that that indicates time. And maybe the observational unit, like the cage and the um, the um, treatment and so forth. Another thing is that um, tidy data dictates that you give a little thought to what what Hadley Wickham refers to as sympathetic data codification. That's a fancy way of saying um, make, try to make it as obvious as you can with what's in your in your data. For example. If you're measuring the sex of uh, the the study organism that you're working on, and you have a column, uh, rather than coding it one and two for males and females, and maybe a three for juveniles, code it male, female, juvenile. Then it's obvious what's in your data. So that's what we mean by sympathetic codification. Um, there should be an explanation of your variables. Uh, that is embedded with your data in some form. So uh, we might call this a data dictionary. I call it a data dictionary. Um, but the explanation of variables is very important. Um, it includes things like the unit of measurement that you've done, but also a little background information to expand on um, may maybe saying uh, how many different factor levels you have for that variable, uh, whether or not it's balanced. Uh, anything that you've made that is an assumption. If you've derived a particular variable from some other variables, you might explain that and explain how you've derived it. Uh, and similar things like that. So I call it a data dictionary that is a has the name of the variable in your data set and then an explanation of what that is. I'll give some examples of that in a moment. Finally, we talked about um, the naming for variable conventions for R, we talked about that last week, but uh, every program has naming conventions. Excuse me just a moment, I'm just gonna close my office door. <clears throat> um, so the conventions that we adhere to are things like that our variable names shouldn't have spaces in them. Uh, that our variable names, um, you know, if you're using R, they can't start with a with a numeral and they can't um, have funny characters embedded in them. So uh, a actually, the naming conventions for variables that are that are in place in the R syntax are common to other um, other statistics programs and computational languages. So that if if you make a a valid name in R, it's liable to be a valid name in every kind of analysis system you might use now and into the future. So simple, clear naming conventions. If we talk about the um, type of file that we store data in, 
Um, we're only going to be talking today about the simplest of files. So two dimensional files with some columns with data and some rows that have uh, individual observations. <clears throat> and we're, we're going to stop short. We're not going to mention uh, in the boot camp at all uh, other kinds of um, structures to hold data that are conceptual, like databases. So here we're talking about um, really just a couple of options for what sometimes statisticians call square data sets, columns of variables, rows of observations. So uh, one of the commonest are um, delimited files. They, they may be text delimited files that are just um, using plain old computer text in a, in a plain old computer text file that's generic. Windows has a format, Linux has a format, and Mac has a format, and the, they all share um, the simplest format is common to all of them. It's a way to code the symbols for uh, alphanumeric characters, ASCII format. Um, the types of files uh, that are common for ASCII coded data, the simplest form, and also the smallest memory um, form of data are comma separated values files. I'll show you what that looks like in a second in a text file. But uh, the extension <clears throat> for that, the dot, and then the three characters after a dot that tell the operating system what kind of file it is, is dot CSV for comma separated values. We can have other delimiters, though. Uh, it's called comma separated values, by the way, because every along a row, every value is is just separated by a comma, and that tells the computing system you're using that um, that there are um, how many variables there are in that row and w when one ends and the other one begins. But they can be delimited with other characters. We could have plain old text files that might be delimited by, in fact, you could use any character. You could use an asterisk or a space or a semicolon. Um, tab delimited files are a common delimiter. There, there are others as well. You can even make your own. Why you would make your own, I can't imagine. You'd want to use one that is commonly used by other people as much as you can. Now, usually best practice with this, this kind of file is that the first row is called the header, and it contains the variable names, also separated with a delimiter. And um, well, if you use these text delimiter delimited files, they're very good because every computing system, even old software and, and probably software far into the future, can read these. And you don't need special software to read these files. That's good. That's all very good. Problem with this format is that it's not as easy to embed information in the same file with, uh, with your data. So you'd have to have your explanation of your data in a separate file. That's not the end of the world. You know, you can always zip those files together and, you know, come up with a way to name them so that it's obvious that they belong together. And for you, while you're sitting at your computer, no problem at all. But remember, you're not practicing type data for yourself right this hot second while you're while you're thinking about it and you're you're right in front of your computer. It's for your future self after you've forgotten. Maybe it's a couple of years later and you do a follow-up experiment and you want to get back at that data. Or maybe it's to archive the data for your supervisor or a collaborator or a, a grant funder. More and more data, data archiving is, uh, is required for publication. So we do have, with delimited files, this problem with explaining the variables. Now, um, Excel is my, my file format of choice. On, you can add a tab to add your data dictionary on there. The only thing with Excel is for people when they first start using Excel, they use it uh, also as an analysis tool to embed graphics and formatting and spaces and um, graphs sometimes. And that's not tidy. So if you use Excel, it must be tidy. Uh, I use Excel and I teach others to use Excel. And uh, even though I stop short of insisting that other people who work with me use Excel, I think these days it's the best and it's the easiest and most accessible to everybody. 
I used to avoid Excel because it was proprietary software and I had um, collaborator, collaborators in other countries, Costa Rica, Belize, in my early career. And uh, they didn't they didn't have access to Microsoft products. But now really every country, every person who uses data does have access to it, at least through open office or LibreOffice or some alternative software that uses the Microsoft format openly. So I think Excel is the best format these days. We want to always avoid storing your data in proprietary formats like SPSS. They have their own data format. Genstat, they have their own data format. If you've heard of some other ones that I've used during my career, I've used um, Systat, I've used SAS, I've used Minitab. Every single one of them has their own data structures. Thing with SPSS is probably the worst one because I've used it for my entire career from an undergraduate to even occasionally these days, someone will force me to use SPSS against my will. My early data sets, the first time I encountered really strong thinking about data, data types was I had some of my own data in SPSS format from some experiments I did during my own PhD. And I, I didn't publish all of my chapters immediately during my, my own PhD. Some years later, even after some postdocs, I went to publish my last data set. My data set was in an early SPSS format this had been some years, and I went to open my data set. Nope, it, they had changed the format in their own software with SPSS, and they wouldn't read their own data format, still the exact same extension from years previously, and I actually lost that data. I've never forgotten that, but I've heard this story many times by other people. So you just have to avoid these. They will all read in Excel files or CSV files. Just stick with archiving your data in those formats. Now, this is a picture. If you read the boot camp, you can download this file and look at it yourself. It's a real experiment. It's real data. Someone really sent this to me and asked for help for it. It's it's organized. You know, you can see what's going on here. I hope I'm going to zoom in my screen a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. Hope that's a little bit better for you. Um, what you can see is their data is over in this table. You can see that they have variables, sample ID, something called a sample, something called RT, something called a peak area, something called a total concentration in nanograms, something called an individual concentration, and something called the peak area one nanogram. And there's just one number and no other numbers there. They also have a little summary embedded, it's just summary statistics that summarizes it by what they call the sample. They also have a couple of graphs embedded in this spreadsheet. So somebody sent me this spreadsheet. It was an experiment they had done. <clears throat> and well, like one of the things that I noticed was that these names are not quite right and they have parentheses in them. So we'd have to change the names right away to analyze this in any software program probably. Another thing I noticed right away was that the sample has actually two bits of information. It has a species of the, well, the genus of an aphid. And there are two different genera used in this experiment. But they also have um, a treatment. And the treatment uh, and the, um, the account of the genus can't be disentangled because they're in the same column. The RT, I noticed, uh, has, a, has a missing value that they have coded with an NA. But uh, there's almost no variation in this RT column. What the heck does that mean? There's some 16.25s and some 16.24s and then one missing data. Now the, the code in R and in other programs for missing data is either to leave it blank or in R it's capital N A. But in slash A is not a code for anything other than a character big N forward slash big A. So that's a problem. Got some zeros here, which um, now if you're measuring something, I, I see this quite commonly, where someone you've got a bunch of measurements and then you get to one where like maybe the the insect died, and you can't measure the thing, so you put a zero in there, but you actually didn't measure a zero. It's the absence of data, and I sort of suspected that this was a failed treatment rather than 
and actually measured zero. Okay. And of course, all of this stuff is just gibberish embedded in the, um, the thing. Well, I'm not going to belabor the point too much, but I <clears throat> earlier in my career, I, I have stopped pretty much doing this just because I refuse to do it most of the time. This is such a small data set. I went ahead and tidied this data set myself. I've had some extreme cases here. I, I, the most extreme one was for one square data set with about 200 rows and maybe eight or 10 columns. Someone sent me uh, 42 separate data files with different versions and different parts of the data, but it just all fit in one, one data set. And I, I, even this morning, I was talking about one that had about, it, it had more data, about a thousand rows, but the, it was sent in a spreadsheet with 10 different tabs so that it was all separate and had to be tidified. So what does this look like tidy? This is an untidy version of this data. This is the tidy version. Still in an Excel spreadsheet. Notice now there are two tabs. One says data, one says dictionary. I've got ID, separated out the aphid from the treatment. Um, I've replaced the zeros that weren't really zeros with NAs. I could have just left these blank, but I like to be explicit if I'm if I'm really tidifying a data. I've changed the names of the variables so there are no spaces. Uh, I don't have the um, units of measurement in the file name. Remember, one of the aspects of good practice is to keep those file names or those variable names short. And in the data dictionary, if we just peek on that tab, we can define um, what the what the unit of measurement is in the data dictionary. It's always in the same file. It's always paired with your data. It's always right there. <coughs> there was a conversion embedded in this that you couldn't guess whatsoever and that initially wasn't given to me that um, you could figure out if I just go back to the raw data, this, this number up here in the peak area were conversion factors for calculating some of the other variables. So that's what you do. That's tidy format with a, with a simple one. Here's what the tidy data looks like in comma separated values format. Notice I've just opened this in Notepad and Windows, but you could use any text program in Windows or other software. Um, and it just has the first row is the name of the, the variables, and every other row have the data values for each individual observation separated by commas. And that reads straight into Excel, reads straight into R, reads straight into every stats program. I think there is one advantage with um, with uh, this used to be true, and it's not true anymore. There, there used to be one advantage with uh, comma separated values files. If you had a lot of data and you used Excel instead of a, a text file, the Excel file tended to be much larger, especially, um, well, it was especially true for small data sets, actually. If you had a lot of small data sets, the Excel file would be 10 or 20 times the memory space of um of one and and a big data file would be um just a little bit bigger in excel in in the amount of memory it took up there are lots of reasons for that but it was it was to do with the formatting and embedded potential formatting in excel files these days it's not true the excel files now for large files are smaller because they have a compression algorithm built into the file types quite quite nice doesn't make it accessible necessarily for the future, but it is quite nice. All right, so how do you get your data into R? Well, um, I'll show you two ways. One way to do it, if you read through the and work through the R terminal yourself, the instruction is to download the tidy version of that, um, that AFID data set. And uh, the first step, though, always is to set your working directory. You, the place where you're going to store your data file locally on your computer, or it could be a web URL. Um, you you want to set your working directory local, though, for inputs and outputs, and, and where the usually that's where the script that you're running lives as well. Now you can do this from the session drop-down menu in R Studio. Choose Set Working Directory, and then choose the directory, and it will allow you to navigate. This works on Macs, Linux, and and Windows this way. Control Shift H 
um, allows you to do it as a hotkey. I prefer to do it in code, uh, and I've set up the template script, as you know, to do it in code. So we'll, we'll do that in the live coding. <clears throat> now, once you uh, have your data set, once it's in tidy format, that's usually the hard part for, um, for most new users. The easy part really is reading it into R. We do this with code. Um, if it's for a comma separated values file, we use read.csv. Uh, there are other ways to do it. This is just the easiest based R way to do it. And literally all you need to put in there uh, in the function is to feed it the name, the character string, including the extension of the data file in double quotes. Um, if it's delimited with some other character space tab or something else you the generic version of read.csv this assumes that the separators are commas uh, is read.table you can you specify the separator yourself in read.table and there are other versions of this that are specific to particular ones but the generic one for any delimited files read.table the one that i use every day is um, read.xlsx the uh, the Microsoft Excel, the the modern, the newest uh, file extensions, four characters, XLSX. <clears throat> now to, the, to use that function requires that you install and load a library called OpenXLSX. And I just have that at the top of most of my scripts. I don't have to remember it. It's it's just part of the workflow. Many others exist though. There are, there are libraries that allow you to read in um, GenStat data files, SPSS data files, but it requires you to download the library. And remember, that's not best practice because it's it's proprietary format likely to change under commercial license. So just just do it in Excel. Use OpenXLSX. It's the easiest way. Now, the last little bit of what we're going to talk about, <coughs> and this will be uh, most of the coding that we do, is um, manipulating variables. So we're going to be talking about R space. And uh, in a data frame, this works a little bit different um, than, than regular variable manipulation in R space. When we read in a data frame, you can think of a data frame as being like a box that contains the variables that are in your data set. And by default, when you read in your data frame, what you see when you read it in is uh, you know, the metaphor is that you see a box that contains your data. And the, on the, the box, you can see the name of the data frame. So it might be called like my data uh, or Ed's data or, or AFID data or something like that. But the names of the variables that you need to access the variables are inside the box. You, you actually can't see just the names of the variables. Let's say, let's say there's a length variable called length. Well, um, if you had a vector that was outside of a data frame called length, as you know from the previous boot camps, you would just type the name of length and submit it, and the butler would show you the contents of the variable length. But in this case, with a data frame, this is just a conceptual thing that the metaphor illustrates, is that the variable called length that is inside the data frame is inside the box, and you can't see the name length. So if you invoke the name length, um, it won't be found. So instead, we access the name of variables with a special operator, the cash sign, the dollar sign uh, operator. So we would have the data frame, cash sign, and then the name of the variable. That's how we directly access variables. That that tells R, the cash sign says, look, look for the, the data frame that's called the first part. The cache sign indica indicates your desire for the system to reach inside the data frame and pull out the variable for using in an analysis or just to see the contents. And we can use the uh, function str, that stands for structure, to examine the structure of the data frame. This is a bit old fashioned, although I do still use it really frequently in my own, my own um, um, scripts. It's a bit old fashioned these days because um, these days in the global environment, you have a visual representation 
of the structure of your data set. So you can just use the graphical user interface, but we will look at the, um, the what structure does for us. Another thing is that we talked about matrices last time and the square bracket notation, where if you have a matrix with two dimensions, we would use the square brackets after the name of the matrix to access the rows first, then a comma, then the columns second. And in exactly the same way do these square brackets function for data frames. So the um, first space before the comma is the uh, space where the row number of data uh, exists. And in the second space is either the column index number or we can access variables by the, the character string in quotes of their of the name of the variable. So we can manipulate the index operator on data frames exactly, works exactly the same way as a two dimensional matrix. And finally, there's another function. I have to mention it because people, I have just observed um, that people learning to use R are comforted by this function. When we use attach and, and inside the, uh, the function, we pass the name of a data frame. What that does is it says, listen, um, to the uh, to the butler helping you in the R system, listen, I want you to open the data frame and I want you to make the, the straight up names of all the variables in the data frame accessible to me directly. I don't want to mess around with a cache sign syntax. And for small data sets, this works perfectly fine. I think it is best practice, especially when um, you have bigger data sets and lots of lots of variables and they all have kind of similar names and maybe you have more than one data frame object floating around in memory. I think it's best to avoid actually using attach because it overwrites if you have variables of the same name, the the latest one you attach overwrites the older ones. It's very easy to make mistakes when that happens. So um, it's OK. I think people like to learn to use this. It comforts them. It's OK to start using it, keeping in mind that later on we have to be careful with it. OK, so some live coding. Let's go over to R. Uh, before we go to um, R, I want to go back to the um, page and um, just point out that I've put up the script template. So if you're following along, you can uh, later, when you go through the boot camp yourself, you can you can open the strip script template and make your own script. If you want to follow along with me now, I'm going to download this. I haven't done it yet. I've, I've made this script earlier for the web page, but I'm going to demonstrate the whole thing, setting up a local directory. So I'm going to download this by right clicking, saving as. I'm going to navigate on my own computer to a place where I I have the active work for the Herrig group, and I don't have one set up for today, but I'll just do that real quick, make a new folder. I'm just going to save it there. Um, and also the thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to open up the boot camp page. So this is where you would be working. And I'm just going to um, scroll down. There's a tidy data example Excel file. That's the one that I showed the picture of. I'm just going to right click that and save as to my to my working directory. So that's 1.4 dash tidy dot XLSX. And then I'm just going to um, scroll down to the to the bottom with the practice exercises, and there's a data file for that as well. But I'm going to right click, save link as. And that's called 1.4 dash butterfly dot xlsx. I'm just going to keep it there. We might not get to it but I'm going to have that all in my working directory. So if we look in my working directory now, we can see that I just have my folder. And I have those three files. 
So I'm just going to open this R script now in R Studio. <laughs> now, uh, this is the one I made earlier. Um, I'm not, I've opened it now several times to show the template script that has a placeholder for the header and the table of contents. And I encourage you to start with the template script and type in your own code for this rather than copying and pasting. So um, one of the one of the tasks a little bit lower down is to set our working directory, which we're going to do now. There's just reading for the tidy data concept. And there's just a little bit of um, reading for the common data files. Then there's some reading and looking at the tidy and untidy versions of data for the um, the Excel and data setup sections. So if I if I click on each of those tidy data concept, there's no code on the boot camp. And we can see that there's also no um, code on the common data types. There's also no code on the Excel. So the first time that there's code is on the um, getting data into R section. So that's where we're going to start. Now up above in that template script, I set a, a place for you to set your working directory. But part of this work, um, this bootcamp page is about the working directory. So I've set up the code here. Now, every time you um, install this to a different computing system, whether it's Windows or Linux or Macs, there will be some local system unless you choose to edit this in the files for setting your um, your your default working directory when you start a new session. And we can use the get WD. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so people can see. And then I'm also going to um, now fill the window with the script so that it's easier to read. The um, the get WD uh, function you don't you don't pass any argument to it. Uh, what you do is you just run it. You submit it with the open and closing brackets and all, um, and it gives back your your current working directory that R thinks um, which directory your R thinks your working directory is. So it's kind of when you're getting started doing this, it's uh, convenient to have that just so you can test and make sure you understand how the world works. So if I back out of this again, um, remember also it's good practice when you use functions for the first time to to bring up the help menu. Uh, we can always do that by by using the help function and then the name of the function get WD. But I've just done that in all caps, so I have my caps lock. So you can read a little bit about um, get WD and its cousin, which we'll use in a moment as well, set WD, and you can see how it works. You should do that just routinely until you memorize some of the basic functions that we're using. So let's see where R thinks my working directory is. So it thinks that it's on my local C drive. This is in Windows. Uh, in a users folder, my login alias WEH90 and um, my documents folder. But I don't want to dump a bunch of folders in my documents. I want to make a special folder for every analysis where the data set for that analysis lives, where the script for that analysis lives. <coughs> You'll all want to do that too with your individual data sets, projects, tutorials, the boot camp, and so forth. It's best practice. So what we're going to do is we're going to set our working directory. Now to set our working directory, I walk through this in the boot camp, but I'm just going to demonstrate it now in Windows. I've gone to my folder where I, where I want my working directory to be. And in Windows, what you do is you click up in the, uh, the um, file explorer. And if you just left click once, it automatically selects all the text. We've already discussed the fact that R expects um, the folder 
location to, to be separated by forward slashes. And there are a couple of ways around this. My current way around this is just to copy this. So I'm going to just just um, copy it. I've right clicked and click copy. You could hit control C as well. Now I'm going to go back to R. I'm going to alt tab back to uh, R. And I've set up the code here. If we use this syntax, it's funny syntax with a little r, a quote, and a open parentheses, and then a close parentheses quote, and and then it's it's inside the set wd parenthesis. If we use this syntax and just paste in that directory, we don't have to change the direction of the slashes. You can take my word for it. I'm just going to submit this. Look down in the console. It's going to echo my submission. Three, two, one. No complaints from the butler here. So um, I just want to uh, use get WD again. I've put it a second time here, and I put lots of comments. I'll just make this so that we can read the comments. I put lots of comments here, um, but normally I probably wouldn't go to the formality of making an extra line because I could just recycle this line. But just for, for your benefit, I've, I've recycled it. I'm going to submit it. Three, two, one. And it switches us automatically down here. And it got my working directory after I set it. Sure enough, it's set to the folder I want it set to. Notice that um, that even though I, I pasted in the backslashes, using this little syntax has changed automatically the slashes to forward slashes. In Max, you don't have to do this. It's, it's a benefit. OK, so we're back to our script. And uh, let's go back to where we were. OK, so we, we've set our working directory. And now, um, now every time I ask for a file, like uh, the file we're about to read in, <clears throat> By default, the first place that R looks, unless we tell it differently, will be in this directory that's our working directory. It's good practice when you're reading in data to just have a peek at the data. Now, I, I showed you a picture of the data before, but it's also good practice not to trust anybody. Make sure that you take full responsibility for data you're working with. So don't trust me. Um, I've opened this file. I'm just going to click Enable Editing. It opens. It opened up to the dictionary tab, so I'm just going to click on the first tab, that's the data tab, and you know you should be able to see that it's it's the data that I um, showed you in the slide. It's just that um, AFID data. You could read a little bit about it if you want. So I'm going to close the file. Don't need it open. It doesn't matter if it's open. You could leave it open. In fact, sometimes if I'm working with a new data file, I, I might even leave it open in Excel just to check, just to check that everything is correct. I was just given a data. The data I was working on all morning was from the um, the potato company, Branston. They gave me um, a big data set full of different measurements of different fields of potatoes, and I was doing some analysis on that. <clears throat> and I thought, OK, Branston, I knew that they had a statistician. I knew this data came from the desk of the statistician. I don't know the statistician. They could be young and inexperienced, or they could just be somebody who's, who maybe I wouldn't necessarily consider formally to be a statistician who just does some statistical analysis. But I just, I just opened the file, and I started looking, doing some of the normal checks I do for errors. And I did find a couple of important errors in the data set that I had to fix, and I just left the spreadsheet open and I just reread it in when I fixed the errors and saved. I could just read it in every time. So that that is how I work with uh, Excel and R. I usually do have Excel open. Now remember to read this in. We're going to have to read in this library. And I've left in this code right here that I've commented out that's install.packages open XLSX and I've set the dependencies, the dep argument to true. Now, if you need to install this, just uncomment that and run it if you need to. I've already installed it. I'm not going to install it again, but I'm going to load the library. Look down in the console. It'll just echo it, and it won't have any output. Three, two, one. 
going to use the read.xlsx function that is in the OpenSLXX um, package to read in the name of that data set in quotes. And I'm going to put it in a data object called my underscore data. I'm just going to make a space up here so that you can see the global environment and my data should pop in right up there. Three, two, one. There it is. 18 observations of seven variables. Now, um, we can examine it by clicking on this blue button. And we can see the variables. We've done this before in the global environment. In our space, the metaphor, the box called my underscore data has popped up in our space with us. And that's what we can see, the name and that it's a data frame. And we can see some with the global environment here, we can see some other information about it. But in our space, we just see the name. So we've used the class function before, and we can just confirm that uh, my data is of the class data.frame. So I look down in the console, three, two, one. There it is, it's a data frame. The world is working well. We can also see in the global environment that it's classed as a data category. And as we accrue different kinds of um, variables in here, we'll see other different identifiers. OK, so we're going to use the names function now. We talked a little bit about it. I mentioned it in the talk. You can read a bit about it um, here. I'll just make this big so we can all see it. So it returns the names of um, of variables in our objects. Um, so uh, if we use this, I'm going to execute this. The console will pop up three, two, one. Now, um, let's see here and see what I'm getting up to here. Uh, I think I ran the wrong, um, wrong thing. I'm asking what the names for my data is. OK, here it is. Let's pop this up. It ran a few lines of code, which I didn't intend it to. Let's do the names again. Three, two, one. There we go. So the names have um, told me what the names of the variables are inside my data frame. And we can see them up here in the global environment, but you know, again, this is a little bit of a throwback. You don't have to use R Studio to use R, and so this is a way to explore R space formally. Sometimes it's useful also if you have a big data frame and it's clunky to scroll through all the names in a data set, and you often do have this, you can search through the names vector, um, and it's very convenient. You can also change the names by manipulating the names vector. So this is very convenient to use. All right, so let's look at the script. So the cache operator. <clears throat> now the cache operator allows us to directly um, access the contents of variables. So let's go back to the um, script view with the console view there. And if you look down in the console, the first code I'm going to do is going to be to act access the const.end data with the cache variable attached to the data frame my data. So this should deposit all the numeric values in the vector const.end. There you go. There's the one missing value and the other um, values are wildly different from one another. Um, but you know we could try we could try it on. What if we submitted this just the name of the variable? Boom, we get the default um, error message that we didn't find that in memory because it can't be seen. It's inside the box called my data. So to get similar data to, um, to um, what we can see in the global environment, we can use the structure function. One, there we go. If I just raise this, and make this bigger, it, it essentially gives us the same information in text form. It tells us um, what the name of variables are, tells us what kind of data vector they are. We note here, for example, that where aphid name is a character, string of characters for the two different um, aphid genera, really they would be a factor. So I'm, I'm, you know, I would be remembering this. Treatment also is definitely a factor. So uh, 
we've talked about this before. We have to be a little bit careful, and uh, I often use structure. <clears throat> now we can access um, individual values in our data vectors. So we have this concentration total data. I'm just going to look at the contents. Three, two, one down in the console. So we've got all these variables. We can exploit the addresses of the variables with the square brackets syntax. So uh, if I specify the addresses one through six, notice how these have indexes. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then it wraps around to seven. So we get a wraparound of the index. So if I specify one to six, I should just get those first six values. Three, two, one, two. So we can manipulate this in, in all sorts of ways, and this is something you use all the time. The dimensions, we can use the help to get a little help for the help page of that function. I'm not going to look at that now so that we can get through this code, but uh, that just tells us how many dimensions there are. We know from the global environment we have 18 and 7, which we do. I don't know why I said there were six columns there when there are clearly seven. Um, if we leave the indices blank, it implies that we want all of the values of the indices. So this would be printing out the whole data set. I'm just going to make the um, screen a little bit smaller so that we can kind of see most of the data set for that. But you can see um, that it just prints the whole data set if I don't specify any indices, which is the same as if I don't use the uh, just selected my data now, um, just the my data and not the um, parentheses, and I'll just print it again, three, two, one. So we get the same thing as if we don't specify anything. We can get the names with a names function. So we have the names like we got before, but this is actually a vector. We can actually mention um, the address of the vector. So if there are six names, we can get the sixth name. There are actually seven names. Um, we'll get the const.tope with uh, specifying the sixth location on the vector. So here it goes, three, two, one, tope. This square syntax is very important to slice out different parts of your data set. This is infinitely useful. We do this all the time, so useful. So what if we wanted to slice out all the rows of just the sixth column, const tote data? We could specify it with the square brackets. Three, two, one. We get the uh, const tote data in this column. Now just as a vector. We can specify the rows explicitly. Get the same data. This will be exactly the same output because there are 18 rows. We can confirm. We can also specify the name of the column. So we can specify cont tote and cont end to get them respectively. And I'm just going to do that. Bam, bam. So this is a way um, that we can do. And if we want more than one, if we want to slice out more than one variable, we can do that with a concatenate function by concatenating the strings of the two names. So now we will get um, a slice of this data frame for just those two variables. So this is something we use all the time. Now I'm conscious we're just out of time, but I'm going to quickly go through this next little bit before I end, because there's just a little bit. <clears throat> So um, again, back to this error. If we just invoke the name of one of the variables, const.end, concentration individuals, get this error that um, the data are not found. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. But this is where the attach function comes in. So remember what attach does. We could bring up the help. I'm going to use the hotkey for bringing up the help. So instead of using the help function, 
I'm just going to um, click inside the name of the function I want help on, and I'm going to hit F1. Boom, we get the um, help page. You can read a little bit about it, but what this does is it um, it it adds the the um, the path to the names vector for a an object that you pass to attach, and it, it works on different kinds of data structures, including data frames, which we're going to use it on now. So if I attach my data, remember I just um, submitted cons end and I get nothing. Three, two, one, confirm, we get nothing. Now I'm going to attach my data, so attach the path. So this is like telling the butler in our space, hey, um, I'm going to tell you some names, and all these names are, I'm, I'm about to tell you are actually inside my data. So now, from now on, when I tell you the name, I want you to look in my data for these. So when I run attach, I don't get any output from attach. That just something has just happened. Some work has been done. But now, now that the data are attached, I can invoke the name, three, two, one, and I get the data. So attach is quite useful uh, when we're starting out. We can, um, we can also use, sometimes if you have a lot of data and a lot of stuff going on, I mean, if you have a lot of stuff going on, I probably wouldn't um, recommend using attach necessarily, but uh, but if you do have a lot going on and you need to manage what is attached and what's not, you can actually remove the attachment of those names with detach. <laughs> and we can we can invoke the help page. You could read about it. But if we re um, uh, if we detach the names from my data three, two, one, it's just echoed the command. Some work has been done. And now um, we ask to print out the contents of const.end. We get nothing. It's been detached. Well, that's it. We're out of time. We do have these practice exercises. I hope you guys are um, reading through these and doing the exercise. Let's just look at a few of the exercises in the last minute or two. So uh, this instruction was download the data file above. Let, let's go ahead and do one of these exercises together. It says to download the data file above. And if we look at the um, what above means here, um, there is a link at the practice exercises on the boot camp page. So it's referring to the data file on the link above. It says download the data file above and place it in the working directory. So we, we did already do that. Download it in and I put it in my working directory. And uh, read in the data file and place it in the data frame object called data1. So let's just go ahead and do that part. I'm going to name a data object called data1. That adheres to the R naming convention. It's short and sweet. We know what it is. It doesn't start with a number, has no funny characters or spaces. And we're going to read it in. Now, to read it in, we have to put together a few things. It's an Excel file, so we're going to need to load open XLSX if we haven't already done so, and use read.xlsx. And then we're going to need to put in quotes the name of the file in our working directory. I usually, we can type this, but I usually don't trust myself to type names if accuracy is, um, if accuracy matters. I'm actually going to go ahead and clean out my my global environment for this. Let me get rid of that. And now we can see when butterfly data in the data one object pops up three, two, one. There it is. So this is a, a data object that's got a diet that's a factor, control, and something else, the length of something, and the sex. And the sex is coded as M and, and F. Of course, if this is in tidy data format, we have a dictionary. So you can read a little bit about it. <clears throat> I don't give you much in information here, but this is the length of the right antenna of some kind of organism, a butterfly probably given the name. Two levels of a factor for sex, M and F. And um, there was a diet factor with two levels of control or an enhanced diet. OK, so it's looking at insect growth, it seems like. OK, so we've read in our data. 
After examining the data, we use the mean function to calculate the mean of the variable length and report the results in a comment to two decimal points accuracy. So this is drawing on the previous bootcamp page where we use the mean function on the length variable. Remember, we need to use the cache sign. Data one, cache, length, have the drop up. So I'm just going to use it. Boom. And we get the um, the mean, and it says also then to report the results in a comment to two decimal points accuracy. It was in millimeters. It's in millimeters, decimal points. So I added the accuracy. We're out of time. Uh, I've been at it all day. Any comments or questions just before we um, we break it off? Okay, I hear my family clambering downstairs. So uh, I'm going to go down too. I'll uh, see you next time. I sent in the email um, that uh, what I would like to do is I would like to finish the last boot camp. Uh, for the first module next week, but then I, th I think um, I'm planning to break it off for a couple of weeks for uh, just for the holidays before it all starts up again. So um, I'll I'll think on this. If you have any thoughts on this, drop it in Slack or send email to me and uh, let me know what you think. And otherwise, I'll I'll see you later. See you guys later.